Thank you, everyone. Welcome in. Thank you for joining me today. My name's Hannah. I'm going to be your guys' implementation specialist leading today's training. Um, today is a live Q&A webinar. So we're kind of going to go over based off of, um, you know, what you guys want to go over, um, depending on what kind of uh, questions we have. It looks like we have a couple questions right now. Let me go ahead and pull those open. Uh, good morning, <laughs> Todd. Good morning. Alrighty. So we've got our first question. I'm looking for best practices related to addendum related to triggers. I have currently set up that if any addendum related files update uploaded to a file role, it triggers a template. However, once the trigger is triggered, it cannot be run again. So in the case where I get one addendum and then I get another one a few days later, I can't rerun the trigger. I can't re-trigger the tasks again. Thanks in advance. So it kind of depends. Um, Kyle, I mean, you can, you can, if you find you're, you're having it that the addendum gets uploaded multiple times on one property, um, you can obviously clone that trigger. I'm not sure exactly which plane you're on. So I'm going to assume that you're on the scale plan um, because you're talking about triggers and, and triggering things. And when you have a file role uploaded, then it triggers certain things for you, right? Um, so I'm assuming you're talking about property triggers. Cool. Wonderful. So it kind of depends. I mean, what I usually suggest is that if you have it where this trigger might come up later on, then I would have it as, I mean, you can clone it. So you've got more than one, um, but you can also add on, you know, when conditions are met, like you can add on the different kind of like, what else do we need that's paired with that addendum? Um, it's kind of hard because I, I need an example of a of what kind of addendums you would have where you would need to re-trigger the same tasks again. Um, Cause obviously, you know, here I have an example, these are templates, um, they're task template. Um, this one's to remove that task template. If we're just specifically talking about adding on task templates um, and I clone this particular one, then it's gonna have the same condition. So technically this trigger would come up twice. We don't typically um, do that, but uh, you know what, let's go for it. Let me go ahead and grab you. I think I should be able to, uh, let me make sure that you're the only one <laughs> that you have that I'm clicking on the right name. There we go. Okay. So you should be able to, is it going to let me? Okay. You should be able to unmute. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. Appreciate you doing that. Yeah, no worries. Um, so the way I have it set up now, and I'm talking about um, of various types of addendums. So for example, FHA, addendum, a mm -hmm. price change addendum, all of those, um, I have triggers set up uh, to basically just email title and lender, as well as making sure it's uploaded to compliance. So those are the the um, triggers and tasks that I have in a trigger template. Okay. But um, the way I have it set up right now is basically um, if uh, for those like seven file roles I have for those addendums, if one of those is uploaded, then trigger the template. Ah. And so, you know, obviously if, if let's say it's an FHA addendum, um, you know, I trigger the template and then it runs what I need it to do. But then if three days later, uh, there's a price change addendum, um, that trigger that we set up um, obviously has been run and it won't, you know, kind of re-trigger again. Right. So, because technically you've already run it. So what I would do is I would actually clone because it sounds like you're just dealing with one trigger template that if it has any of these files uploaded, then you need it. But it's not if any of these files are uploaded. It's when this file's uploaded, I need to do these triggers for that. And then when this another a different file is uploaded, then I need to do the same kind of triggers. But for that particular new file, what I would do is I would just clone it. And I would have it that, well, when an FHA addendum has been uploaded, that's when you have those particular emails to go out, say, hey, here's the FHA addendum. Um, and then have it that when that next document, you know, the, the price, I think you said price change, um, yeah. addendum gets uploaded, then another set of triggers get. So I would probably separate them. Um, the best way to do that is to clone them, is to, yeah. is to go into your account and to a clone them and then have it that, you know, they come on. 
The other thing I'm wondering about though, is that when do you usually receive these documents? Is it like, uh, like once a week? Is it like every couple of days? Is it like, uh, it could be sporadic throughout the transaction. Okay. Right? Um, cause like, um, because we obviously we have the one sheet templates that might be a good solution as well. If you're if you want to build out your one sheet to specifically, you know, share very specific documents kind of thing, um, you can have it where you can have like, you know, this one sheet that goes out weekly and it says, please check, you know, uh, to ensure that you've received all of the xyz documents or whatever it is right because like here here's an example of a one sheet with the documents here you could do something like that where instead of it uh instead of you guys having to rely on sending out individual emails every time you receive that document you have this one weekly email and if the document has been uploaded it shows it right and then whoever it needs that needs that particular document can download it or um you know it, it, if it's not there then it shows that it's not been received yet Gotcha. Um, and this I, would be I, something, yeah, that's helpful for, I, yeah, I, I, I like that solution for like, cool. uh, um, updates, um, on like a weekly basis or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess, uh, I guess one of our fears is, is that, and maybe it's just, you know, trying not to overcomplicate, but, um, no, no worries. We, I guess we, you know, for example, I, I have about nine of these types of addendum file roles. Um, I guess the, the, the fear is like, so we, we end up running nine of these kind of like, I know they're not listener triggers in the background, but basically having these nine triggers mm -hmm. in the background, um, we've really tried our best to not, um, have triggers running in the background if we don't need them I, right because it can uh, seem like a lot on that property right correct. i mean you're looking at it and there's like right and like obviously they're not five and you're like what <laughs> yeah yeah but it, if you want to just if you could just speak to that that you know that's okay <laughs> or it what, is you know, maybe it there's is. ways to, to manage that in your own mind like yeah uh, okay to run that that would be helpful to before we kind of take that step of uh creating of making all of those yeah of yeah. those clones yeah honestly it really is like and this is advice for everyone it's not just for it's not just for kyle it is 100 percent okay for you guys to have so many of those triggers on that property it's not going to say three or one or four or five it's probably going to say around i mean depending on what kind of transactions you're running it could probably say around 50 right because there could be 50 different types of emails as you guys grow your system and you find, well, when this happens, then I need this to happen. Especially when you're on the scale account, you're going to be adding that into your process and then backfilling it, adding it into those other properties. I think the most crucial part about making sure that the scale account is working for you so that you feel confident when you see that number, you're not overwhelmed, but instead you feel confident about it is going to be down to how you're tracking that information, right? So if you're building out those triggers, I would make sure that you have it that, you know, if, for example, there's like a, a version of it that's like buyer signed or seller signed or fully executed, I would account for those when you go to build out the rest of those nine trigger templates um, in your example, Kyle. And the reason I would do that is, is just so that, you know, if you receive a document, you pop that file roll on there, it says that it's buyer signed, you know, that the next step is going to be, um, you know, sending it out for, for the other signatures that you need. Um, that would be one way to do it is making sure that your file roles are, are coordinated. The other way is using your fields and using those statuses to say where you're at with those particular parts of the, um, of the situation. Um, Kelly, if you want to share, you can absolutely unmute and share that if you'd like to, too. That's kind of what I was thinking too, is just having small chunks. Every day isn't going to come on every single time. So in, like you were saying with the intake form in the field, mm -hmm. um, use that as an opportunity to only bring on those triggers if you need them, like um, just the FHA ones and just um, the different ones for uh, whichever addendums you were talking about. I know when I did it um, in California, we have addendum after addendum after addendum, and I just built it out for addendum one, built it out for addendum two, and built it out for addendum three, and we had... Um, extensions of time addendums that were the same thing and they could happen any time during the transaction too. So I just made little chunks. So only little chunks would come on as I needed it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's great advice too. That would be the other thing I would kind of think about as well is like, well, when I say it's this particular finance type, that's when I want these particular things to come on. And so like, you can see where your fields kind of like filter into every part of this. And, you know, a lot of the time what I see people struggling with when it comes to their fields is down to like, well, I don't know which fields I need to use, or I don't know which fields to go with, right? Especially when you're, you're building it and then you're handing it off to someone else to, to keep it updated. Um, and I think that going off that color coordination is really going to assist you in the long run. Um, I kind of drive it home a lot when it comes to color coordination. And the main reason is, is that, well, if you guys have like a, a what do they call it? A legend of, well, when it says this color, that means that there's a trigger associated with it. It just helps you in the long run with like, okay, cool. Well, I know, you know, my EDM status not received. If it's red, I know that there's a trigger associated with it kind of thing. Like I know that I'm going to have an email that goes out. Um, I've seen other people have it where their fields have had like a standard color of most of them being like um, yellow when they get started, right? So you go to that field. I'm just going to go ahead and grab a, I think this TC filing status is fine. TC fee status here. We'll go down to the bottom to table background color and they'll make it yellow. And that way, when they're looking at it on that property, let me go back to Ivy Lane because I believe I have it on here. Oh, I have a, I have a value selected. Let me say blank. What this can do for me is I can know, okay, if it's yellow, that's associated with one of my triggers, one of my property triggers. And the moment I update that status to whether it's received, not received, whatever that needs to be, I know that that's going to set me up for another trigger that comes on. And this can be really helpful if you tell your, your TCs, hey, I've made some updates to the account. What I want you guys to keep in mind is anything that's yellow in the fields is associated with the trigger. So make sure you have those fields updated and then boom, you can kind of go from there. Um, and I think, you know, with the uh, with the documents, you know, making sure your documents are filed, I think that going through and having those, you know, either the priority buttons or the missing buttons marked on them, or even just having a specific file button um, that says like triggers, right, associated. Um, and having that enabled on that on that particular file will help you in, enormously when it comes to where does everything tie in together, right? It's all about like kind of building it out the way that you need to be able to categorize it kind of thing. And so adding in a file button that just says um, uh, something as simple as property triggers, right? And saying PT and adding it there, it's going to make it a lot easier and you can have it, you know, by standard in your um in your document templates that it has PT as purple. And so that way you know, okay, well, this particular addendum file one has the PT that's purple. That means it's associated with a property trigger. And so when I upload a document to that, I know that a property trigger is going to come up kind of thing. Does that kind of like help out with kind of like the overwhelm as far as for the triggers? Because I know it's it can be a lot, especially when uh, you're looking absolutely. at Absolutely. I appreciate you letting me uh, ask that question. And then uh, yeah. just to follow up on that is, uh, sure. would you be able to at some point walk through, so we, let's say we go and do make big, those changes like that. Can mm -hmm. you show us, uh, I've never really walked through backfill um, and all yes. the different options and, and how to, you know, uh, apply all, I'm assuming apply all those to the current transactions and whatnot. So yes. uh, I'll sign off now, but thanks for uh, taking the question. Yeah, of course. No, yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking the question. And backfill is really great. So yeah, let's really quickly talk about backfill because it is a really, really powerful tool. It's a wonderful tool to use, especially when you're on property triggers. Right now on this particular property, I have the main uh, buyer main contract triggers. So I'm going to go ahead and head into my templates. We'll head down to trigger templates. Oh, and thank you, Kelly, for sharing your advice too. Here are those triggers right here. We're going to select edit. Now, if I make alterations to this, right? The one thing one thing you're going to have to keep in mind, uh, though, Kyle, is that I would probably make the update to the templates as soon as you can, even if you create the shell for it, right? So creating the shell for it is just saying add new, pop in addendum name, triggers, whatever that looks like for you guys. I'm going to make sure that I have addendum there. Say that you have the property triggers and create the template, even if it's blank, okay? Even if you haven't made the alterations to it yet, create that blank one, add it to your intake forms, right? And the reason I say that is that as you start to build into this, then you can use that backfill to have the rest of those triggers come on. If I just created this and I didn't add it to my templates, right? My intake form, it didn't trigger, it didn't add it to the property, then 
if I try to use the backfill, it's not going to apply it to those properties, right? The, the trigger template has to exist on the property for that backfill to truly work. So here I've got that my main buyer's one. I know it's on a property already. To go through and add that in, let's say I just needed to add on another email. And this email is about, oh, I haven't received the EDM yet. Let me see if I have a EDM. It might be called earnest money. Earnest money missing here. We're going to grab that one. So it's still missing. I haven't received it yet. What I can do here is I'm going to use two parts. Number one, I'm going to add on that condition that says, you know, the property field. And they, I think it's called EDM status. Perfect. Is equal to not received. And then I also can add on another condition that says the file role. I think it's called earnest money. Ooh. I'm typing too quickly for myself. Earnest money receipt is missing in the property, right? I want to make sure I have those two there. I can just have one. If let's say you're not using your file roles all that much, you know, you're, it's not something you really care about, but you do have those statuses. You can have it that you only have one. I usually like to add at least two. Um, I might even add a third one, which could be like a contact role. Let's say I need to send this to a specific person. I need to send it to my, um, say, oh, let's say title officer. Oop, do I have title officer in here? Cool. And I need to say that the title officer um, exists in the property, right? So they have to be in the property if I need to reach out. Or maybe we need to say like the buyer's agent exists in the property. I can also add on a contact role if I want to. But here, once I've got that on there, we're going to add in our contingency. So let's say it was like immediately. This would be the moment that we've met these particular requirements. This message needs to go out immediately. Okay. So that's the idea behind that time of day. We could also say, well, if I don't receive it by 12 p.m., the same day as, so I'm going to go into time frame and select same day as earnest money receipt, earnest money due date. Well, if I don't receive it by 12 p.m., the same day as the earnest money due date, and it meets these particular rules, right? It, it's, it's that it's missing in the property and I've marked it as not received, right? Then I need this email to go out to say, hey, we still haven't received the earnest money. It is due today. I need it by 5 p.m. kind of thing. Like send it to me as soon as you possibly can, right? Once I have all of this done, there's a couple steps down here that I'm going to be able to take. I can click on insert trigger. What this is going to do is it's going to take this trigger because this is a brand new trigger. I don't have it on that property yet. It's going to take that trigger and it's going to put it on that property. Now, if you have this update and this needs to be updated on like five different properties you found, what you can do with this as well is say process the trigger after backfill. And what that means is it is going to, and let me see, triggers inside of properties that are not set to add to queue and immediately send will execute if you've chosen to fire triggers. So here, and, I, and I, I'm going to have to do some testing with this, but processing those triggers basically means, do you need to fire it off, right? Is this something that you need to go out right away on those five, five properties instead of just adding it on there? Or do you just need to add that trigger to that particular property? So it's kind of a choice between, do we need to fire it off, right? If it meets the conditions, if the time frame makes sense, do you need to fire it off? Or do you just need to make sure that it's on the property? That way, when we do meet the conditions, or if the conditions have been met, you guys can review, send it out, make sure it's going to the correct party members. So I can select that backfill. It's going to add it to that property. Let's say I make some changes to it. I've deleted the file row. I'm going to head back over to that property. I didn't backfill anything. I'm going to go to my triggers. I believe this one, because I think that, the, okay, I have it as not received, but I do have that due date on there. So I believe we should have this email right here up at the top. Here we go. Ernest Macy, you can actually see here, I've got a completely different trigger that's on this one. Let me see if I have it in my immediate. Nope, that one's not it in process. Ernest money received to closing parties. Schedule. Just trying to figure out where I put this trigger. Where are you? Let me see. Do, 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 do. Oh, you know what? Maybe I need to remove the other one. Where did I put you? Yep. The same day as earnest money's due at 12 p.m., but I know that it's going to change if it's due immediately. What's the other one called that I have in here? Earnest money missing. Okay. 
Let's go back to that property. Let's go to our triggers. Ready to go. We've got earnest money immediately. And this one, based off of the options, is telling me that this is the one that's already existing on there. If we go to immediately, obviously it's going to be there underneath immediately. It's not underneath our scheduled. Is it going to be in process? Here we go. It is going to be in process. Here's that one that we were looking for. So if I scroll down to it, here's that particular trigger. It looks like the due date and time, it says not defined. And I'm wondering if that's because I do not have a due date set for that earnest money due date. I do have a time set for it and a date for it. That's interesting that it says that. Um, but here, what I want you guys to take notice is that those, those conditions have not updated because I haven't backfilled it. So if you go through and you make changes to the conditions and you need to add that on there, you just need to head back into the template, head over to that trigger template, locate the trigger that you need. And then here, the other options are dependent on what they need, right? So if we say, oh, I want to insert my triggers, we can insert our triggers. If I want to update my, my uh, conditions, I can backfill my conditions. If I need to update my options, so let's say I change the due date for this, I actually need this to be immediately instead. I'm going to change this to immediately update, and then I'm going to update the details. Um, although, you know what? The, I don't think that the details update for it, but I've updated that. I need to go to options and say backfill this, push that information back to that property. Once I've made sure to go through and backfill what I need to backfill, when I head back over to that property, triggers, we can see now that those two triggers are ready, but when I open up the triggers, we can see once again, we've got that one at the top that was originally there. And then here's that other trigger with that updated, you know, EDM status is equal to not received. So the backfill kind of allows you to either insert the trigger, take it, put it back on the property. And if it meets the, 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 um, the conditions for that particular trigger, then it, and it has it ready to go. And if not, then you can always kind of wait until it comes up. You can backfill those different, um, conditions that you have on it. You can backfill the options on it. If you've changed the due dates for it, it just kind of depends on what you need. It's a really, really powerful tool. Cool. Let me see if there's any other. Can backfill still be used if we're not using intake forms? We're currently creating a property manually and then applying a property template with appropriate trigger templates. So then just make sure it's on your property templates. If you're not using the intake form, because the reason that I would say the intake form is because technically when you go to the intake form, you need to add it to your form triggers, right? You need to say, well, when it equals this, when FHA or when the finance type is equal to FHA, I need to bring on, you know, my main buyer's task template. And then I need to bring on my trigger template for FHA loan, right? If you're using it on property templates, you would just want to make sure that that particular trigger template is added to that property template. Um, even if it's the shell, like I said, even if it's a blank one, addendum name triggers, I would want to go to my property templates, select edit. Let's go ahead and say it's on the Aspire one and then select that particular one and add it, even if it's blank. That way, you know, for all future properties that you create, you have that trigger template there and you can use that backfill to push it on. So. Let me know if that makes sense. I think that that's, that's good for now. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking the question. Um, all right, next one. This might be a silly question. I'd love to see an example of, re of recommending or your daily use your usual daily flow for managing transactions. So it's going to change day to day. It's going to change even probably like week to week. And it really just depends on how, what, like what your influx is as far as for um, transactions. Um, and it also depends on um, how you have those transactions managed within open and close. Um, if you have it that your agents are filling out the intake forms, um, then your daily kind of like, what do I do? I log into my, you know, I just started my day. It's 8 a.m. I've logged into open and close. What do I do? If your agents are filling out those intake forms, the first thing I'm going to suggest is obviously you'll receive an email that you've received an intake form, but also I would head over to your submitted and take a look at those intake forms. If it's assigned to you and on your specific team, it's going to show up for you. I'm currently on multiple teams. I'm also logged in as the admin. So I'm going to see everyone's intake form here, but first I would review the intake forms, make sure that those look good. You know, maybe it's just a matter of clicking on it and going, oh, cool. This file's here. Let me just double check the contract really quickly. Awesome. This is where we're at with this. Cool. Maybe you don't need to approve it right away, but it's just confirming that this looks good. 
The other thing I would do is if you're logged in right away and let's say you don't have any intake forms, right? You don't have any new properties. I would check out your triggers by priority. If you have your account set up correctly um, or efficiently, as efficiently as it can be, when you check your triggers by priority, what these are going to be is these are going to be the different emails that you need to send out based off of, you know, tasks that you've checked off or um, if you're on the scale account, triggers that have met their different um, uh, their different conditions. You know, you know how I had like I put in a due date for that EDM, right? If I said, you know, it's due at 12 p.m. or let's say I did, I said it was due at 8 a.m. the same day as the earnest money receipt is due and I haven't received it yet. If I go and use my triggers by priority, this is a really quick way to see, okay, what are my top priority triggers? Oh, look, earnest money right here. I can inspect it. Looks like, yep, this is correct. We're emailing the correct party members. Boom, send and send that trigger out, right? The whole idea behind having this widget here is that if you need to send out those emails right when you log in, you're reviewing it. These are the emails that I need to get out right away. I'm going to send them immediately from this particular view. Now, after this point, it kind of depends. It's up to you guys. And it's also up to how you want to view it. If you're like, I need to see the property, focus on that property, make sure everything's taken care of. And then I can go to the next one. Your best bet is to go to properties tab. So you're going to go to properties. I would have a specific, you know, um, a filter that you go to. So let me go to this filter because I think I have segments on here. Cool. Let me go to my buyers pending. Let's say from 8 a.m. to um, 12 p.m. I focus on my buyers, right? If I'm taking care of buyers, sellers, you know, all of the all of the types of transactions that I would do, you could say, okay, well, I'm going to split up my time, you know, in the mornings, you know, for two hours, I pay attention to my buyers. And then, you know, once it gets a little bit later in the day, that's when I pay attention to my listings and I need to go make sure that everyone's listings are set up correctly. Or maybe you set up your listings first. It just depends on what your guys' process is. Just make sure you are segmenting your day so that you're taking care of those different parts. But let's say here, I need to focus on these three properties. I can select these properties and say add to queue. I can also click on the little plus sign and add them to queue. And I like this queue because if I go over to the dashboard, the queue stays here. And what this queue does is it allows me to use these down here arrows down here to toggle through the different properties. So here I'm on Ivy Lane. Now I'm on Main Street. And now I'm on Thor Street. So this allows me to view those properties to see what the information is that I need on it, maybe to send out different emails, check off tasks, make sure I've got documents uploaded, whatever I need to. When I feel good about the property, I can just clear it from the list. Well, now these are the only two properties that I need to focus on. Okay. When I exit out of that property, it's going to just take me back to the dashboard. I can click on that property again. It'll pop it open. The other option that we have, if you're like, well, the properties tab is great, but I really want to focus on my triggers, right? You can also flip this from property view to trigger view. And what this is going to do is this is going to show you your priorities. So it does show you all the information for that particular property. Here you can see I'm on South Thor Street. Here's all of my emails, text messages, triggers that need to go out. If there were any tasks that I needed to complete, they would show up here. Any documents that I need to review, contacts. And that's where those priority buttons are really helpful. Let me grab that um, Ivy Lane. I want to say she's on here. Here we go. I'm going to add the Ivy Lane on here because Ivy Lane, I have like a lot of really great examples on. When I pull up in that Ivy Lane, let's go ahead and flip through our, uh, we'll go to our dashboard and we'll, we'll flip through our pages down here at the bottom. When I go to it here, I can see my triggers. If I continue to scroll down, I've got my tasks that I can check off. I've got my documents. I've got contacts that I can review if there were any fields that I needed to review or notes. And so this is kind of like, okay, are we, how are we viewing this? Do we want to look at it that we want to look at focus on this particular property, right? And how do we want to view it? Do we want to look at the property itself? Do we want to just look at the priorities? We can still access the other parts of the property. You go to this send an opening email here and you go, oh, uh, you know what? This doesn't have all the party members that I need on it. You can click on the contacts and boom, you're on the contacts on that property. You can create a contact. You can search for a contact. Let's say you needed to set up some contacts. Oh, well, Jill and Jana, I need them to get calendar invites. Here I've selected those two people. I can go back up to the top and I can either, you know, toggle it to properties and click back on that property to open up the property page for it. And if I need to add them to different invites, I can click on those calendar dates here. Or if I'm back on that 
priorities view, let's say we added that on there, we can always go to the fields itself. Like maybe we need to search for a specific field. Let's say closing date. Here's closing date. Click on closing date and here we go. I can select the calendar. I can select who I need to send the invite to. Whatever I need to do, I can do it from this screen. It's just a matter of where do I want to click? Where do I want to spend my time kind of going through the information? Um, like I said, the other way, if you're like, you know, the property doesn't really matter to me. I handle mainly listings and a lot of it's just kind of sending out a weekly update or a lot of it's just sending out an update um, that I need to send out. If the property itself doesn't matter and it's specifically you're focusing on the different tasks that you need to take care of, you can go to your task pipeline. Sometimes people will use both. They'll use the property when they're like setting up a new property and you need to focus on that property. And then once they're good with that property, they'll head over to their task pipeline and they'll have different snapshots for the things that they need to focus. Maybe every single Wednesday, I focus on my inspection tasks. And so I'm going to go to that inspection snapshot and I'm going to see, okay, well, what are all my tasks that are marked red that have inspections or inspection deadlines tagged on them? What do those look like? Maybe I need to go to Hannah's task. Let me see if I've got any tasks on here. Looks like I got a couple on here. This one, I could say, well, I want to use the um, the specific team member user. We'll say community team. And I want to see all the tasks that are due to community. Um, and here you could go through and you could, you know, again, we're either, we can either check off this tasks or we can delete the task if we don't need it. We can go down through if we need to reorganize it. Oh, you know, this is going to actually be due in two days. I can go through and move that over. Whatever I need to do, I can do from here. I would also double check which filters you have set on these. So what task display options you have by selecting that little, um, it's kind of like a funnel icon here. Usually for, if it's me, I usually don't really care who it's assigned to. And I believe I don't really care about the task attributes. Yeah. I usually don't care about the task attributes or who it's assigned to. I'm mainly just focused on, I want to see the triggers. I want to see the property options. Cause once again, if I need to add on details, I can click on my little coin option here. I can see my APIs, the utility. I can go and I can click on my little house icon. It's going to pull up my fields. So if I needed to do something, edit something, oh, look, re request preliminary settlement statement. Let me check out that trigger. Let me click on the trigger, say inspect. Oh, looks like we're missing the escrow office on this particular property. Cool. Let me click on my property. Let me add on, um, who else do I not have on here? Kelly. And Kelly is actually my escrow officer. Selected Kelly. Now, if I review this trigger, inspect, it's greeting Kelly. And so this is how you're kind of going through and you're kind of figuring out what your flow is. You're either going to be, you know, when you start out, a lot of people, what I see them do is they still want to view just that property. They're still just trying to get used to like navigating the system and using the system. And so usually they're like, I'm just going to sit on my properties tab here and I'm going to focus on my tables and segments for the time being. And then as you start to get more comfortable with the system, you might go, you will, you know, I'm. I'm getting really good at making sure that my fields filled out, my contacts are on there. You know, when I review that intake form, I've made sure that all my party members are on there, my documents, initial documents are filed correctly. Now I just want to focus on, you know, the tasks that I need to take care of because I'm uh, specifically taking care of this particular portion of the transactions. And so now I'm just going to focus on this. It just depends. Let me know if that makes sense. If anyone else has any other way that they use the system, um, Absolutely share that. Kelly, do you have anything to share as far as for like how you used or managed your daily flow? Um, I had I had three monitors and one of mine was in <laughs> <laughs> I I had it was really cool. I had one of them in portrait and I had my um uh, the task pipeline on that that portrait one. Ooh, yeah. And I just left it there the whole time. And because I had um assistants that worked with me, I could watch what they were checking off or doing and I could jump in if yeah. I need. But then I was able to use my other two monitors to work inside the properties or do tasks or emails or uh, whatever else needs to be done while still focusing on that. Yeah. But I worked mainly through the, the task pipeline. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's just like, I think all expert users, like they slowly but surely go to the task pipe. You're either going to be living in the task pipeline or you're going to be living in the trigger pipeline. Either yeah. one of those, that's where you're going to be kind of living after that point, because this is really where the meat of the the your transactions are um 
And then from that. in the task pipeline, you can even reach the triggers. If you go to, um, let's see. oh, you don't have yours. I might bottom, not have it. It just pops up triggers where it says 20. Yes. I would, I would go, I'd go to it from here. I never even went into the trigger pipeline because I got yeah. to it. Yeah, because what you would do is you'd check off those tasks and then you'd go, okay, cool. Let me review which triggers I just set up for myself, right? And then yep. after and schedule them all. Yep, exactly. Yeah, so that's kind of like an example of like, what are the, it just really depends. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways to uh, water your flowers. <laughs> we'll say that. <laughs> cool. Alrighty. Next question. What is the best way to set up a template so that if information is missing, it defaults to none or something along those lines? For example, if we don't have a buyer phone, the email will show as none on the file instead of just having blank or if CR date is missing, it can default as removed with offer. So that's going to be smart blocks. Um, now when you're building out these smart blocks, the only hard part is, is, you know, when you're talking about a date, that's an easy smart block to build. You can say if CR date is missing, right. In the property, if it's blank, then show removed with offer. However, when we talk about contacts, unfortunately, right now, we don't have a way to drill down the information so much to say, well, does that contact have a specific email or a specific phone number? You know, maybe, maybe they don't have a phone number filled out, but they have a cell phone filled out. We don't have the way to add in the conditional logic to get as drilled down as that on that particular contact. Um, unfortunately, um, but when we're talking about that CR date, you can create a smart block that says, you know, CR date missing or CR date. Um, I think CR date missing would probably be the best, at least as far as for the naming conventions. Um, and then you can have it that if the CR date is empty, then show this instead. And so here, let's go ahead and build it out. Let me see if uh, I think I have an example of it already in my intro emails. I want to say I call them open email address. Here's my answer email. Do I have that at the top? Because it'll be easier if I, okay, cool. I have it right up here at the top. So I have this intro email to buyer. And if I scroll down, I have this smart block for home inspection, um, smart block home inspection start date. So this is an example of what one of those smart blocks could look like. We've got purchase money, earnest money amount, accepted date, smart block for home inspection, closing date, finance type, whatever else I need. In your case, you might have two smart blocks. One of them is if you do have that CR date, and one of them is if you don't have that CR date. The way that this one is built out currently, if I highlight the words and then click on SB, it's going to open up that smart block for me. The way that this one works currently is that if there's an inspection, then it shows the home inspection date. Um, we could also alter that language to say, what's the inspection period? Like, what's the grace period? When do we need to get this scheduled by? It just kind of depends on what you need for it, right? But the way that this one's built out is that if it's there, if we, yes, we need an inspection, bring it on. If not, then we don't. If, for example, we did finance type, let's say we wanted to build it out that, um, uh, actually, finance type is not really a good idea, a good example. Maybe we should just do it with earnest money due date. Let's do it with earnest money due date. So I'm going to build out earnest money due date, which again, probably not the best idea. We always have an earnest money due date, but let's pretend there are some cases where you don't have that um, type of thing. So here I built it out. I have like my area for it. Where do I go from here? I'm going to want to, close out of my emails. I can click on control S to pull open my smart blocks. I can go to the main page, head down to my hammer icon and click on smart blocks to open them up. But the next thing I want to do is create that earnest money due date missing. Just call it something simple. Keep it straightforward. Make sure that we have the name of that smart block match the merge field. That way you know exactly what that smart block is. When I add it in there, I'm going to add it in there. And then here I'm going to type in um, due date, not assigned. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add on a condition that says that if the earnest money is blank, so property field, earnest money due date is blank. Then I want this particular block of text to show up. 
The next thing I'm going to want to do though, is I'm going to want to grab that earnest money one. I'm going to, let me just search for it really quickly. And I'm going to want to make sure that I turn on this inline smart block. What this means is that I want this smart block to stay on the same line as the information that I've added in there. It doesn't need to be on its own paragraph. So here, now that I have that there, I can go back over to my email templates, go into my intro email template, head down to where I have that value here. And I can have two things set up. I'm going to grab onto my merge fields and I am going to go to my um, earnest money due date. I'm going to pop that into there. And then I'm going to go to my smart blocks and I'm going to grab my smart block that I just created. I think it was called earnest money due date missing. And I'm going to put them right up against each other. Okay. So it looks like they're on two different lines. It's just because we don't have enough space to show that, but they are pressed right up against each other. And so now the way that this works is that if that date is there, it's just going to show the earnest money due date. And if that date is not there, then it's going to say a different block of text. To test this out, I'm going to grab the name of the template. We're going to head over to a property. Let's go ahead and go to Ivy Lane. Right now, I do have a date in that earnest money due date. So when I go to add on that email, we'll just go to emails. We'll say apply template. We'll apply that template and we'll say apply. When I just add that on there and I scroll down, it's going to have that earnest money due date. Here's that date matches. This looks great. Let's say I didn't have the date and I'm going to go ahead and remove the contingency. Uh, I don't think I really need to change the start time or end time, but I'm going to do it just to make sure. So this has been removed. This has been on uh, contingency. Here we can say earnest money due date has been removed. I'm going to add that particular template again, just to make sure. Well, okay, if it's not there, what do we do next? What is it going to show next? If we scroll down, now it shows the other font, due date not assigned. And so that's beginning to end how you can build it out for those fields. As long as you have the ability to add in that condition for that particular field, either say it's missing, it's blank, it's not there, then you can have it have both of them, right? I don't need a smart block for my earnest money due date. If the value is there, if I put it on my property, it's going to be there. And if it's not there, then I need it to show this verbiage. Let me know if there's any more questions. I know that that one's a little bit, um, kind of a, a little a couple steps to that one. Um, <laughs> but I just want to at least show you guys what that kind of looks like from beginning to end. All right, next question. Can you pull the trigger out separately and apply it um, manually as needed? You totally could. You totally could. If you're talking about the trigger templates, you can absolutely have it that you have a specific trigger. I would just clone it. So for example, here's that main buyer under contract one. We'll go ahead and make a clone of it. Just going to call it uh, buyer main missing EDM. I've created an exact clone of it. To remove the other ones, honestly, I would just turn them off. You could delete them if you needed to. You could totally like delete them if you wanted to. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you could totally delete them or you could totally turn them off if you wanted to and just have this one turned on, um, just the single trigger. Um, but I would make sure to be using that clone, um, tool. If you're like, well, you know, I just need to make a couple alterations to it. Maybe this one I need to add on, you know, uh, a different email. Right. And that's the other thing, um, to Kyle is that if you need a different email with it and you make clones and you're like, oh, I, you know, maybe I, you know, I, I've got a couple emails that I need to alter. You don't have to recreate the trigger. You just click on email. You can say detached email, and then you can just add on that other email template. I don't know if I have any other missing. Here we go. I have a different missing one that I need to add on there. And so now I've added on that one there. So you can always, you know, like keep in mind that when you create that trigger, there's a lot of things you can do to alter that trigger um, to make sure that it's, it's, you know, pulling the information that you need to pull. Cool. All right. Next question. We are segmenting HOA condo, CD, CDD, lead-based paint, et cetera. So we're only bringing on tasks and triggers to a document if segment is uh, applicable to each property. Yep. Yep. 
that's the, that's the traditional way of doing it. It's something that I've kind of suggested you guys all kind of look into is when we're talking about tasks, when we're talking about triggers, when we're talking about any of those, have them built out separately, have it built out so that you can say, when you say, yes, you're handling this, then it comes on. And that's going to be helpful. Even if you're still using property templates, because if you're using the property templates and you apply it to a property and it adds on the, the, the um, a task template that has all of your tasks in it, that's going to make it so that you have to go through and individually delete the tasks that you don't need. Versus if you have those task templates built out separately, I could say, oh, actually, I don't need my inspection task template. Let me delete that whole entire task template. Even if I'm using property uh, templates, that can be really helpful. Same thing with your trigger templates. If you have them built out separately, let's say you're like, you are anxious about having that many triggers on it. If you do have that anxiety and you're like, oh, there's a lot of triggers, you know, I, I really only need like 30 of them. Some of the triggers came on, you know, are, are um, you know, inactive because they're not something that's applicable. Then what you can do is you can delete that particular template from that particular view here. So I can just delete the inspection trigger template. Can you show how to add these triggers to the intake form? Completely new to OTC, working on building the system. Nothing triggered when the intake form was submitted. Absolutely. So when we're talking about reviewing our triggers, number one, what I would do is as, as long as you clicked on add new intake form and filled out one of these when you created, when you wanted to create that new transaction, once you filled that out, that intake form comes into here. It does need to get approved, right? There could be triggers that are associated with it. So if we haven't approved it yet, make sure that you've approved it. But to check the triggers to see, okay, well, triggers were supposed to come on. They didn't. Click on that little bar up there at the top. And here underneath intake submission, intake approval, this is where we can see what, you know, prop, you know, what, um, what triggers should have fired off either fields or templates, whatever needed to apply is going to apply either when it's been submitted by the agent or when it's been approved by you. So that's one way to check it, um, to double check that it's on there. And then as far as for, well, how do I check, you know, see it? Ooh. Sorry about that. Um, now, how do I how do I go to that intake form and I check which triggers are on there? We're going to head down to our hammer icon. Usually, if you're starting out in the system, I suggest opening up this three line um, icon up here at the top. That way you can expand the view here. We're going to head down to that hammer icon and we're going to get into templates. Once we're in templates, we're going to go down to intake form templates. Once we're on intake form templates, you're just going to select edit on whatever intake form you're editing. I think I have more triggers on my buyer's residential contract. So that would probably be a better example. We'll go ahead and select edit there. Oop. Looks like I, I clicked on some stuff on my keyboard. There we go. Once we've opened that up, we're going to head to form triggers. Form triggers is going to be what needs to come onto the property after it's been submitted or after it's been approved. A quick way to check them if you're brand new to open and close and you're like, well, what triggers have already been built out? You know, I have the buyer's residential contract OTC2. When you click on form triggers, you can click on sort triggers and that's going to pull open the list of all of the triggers that are currently built out on that particular intake form. At the top, what I hope you'll notice <laughs> is that all of the green triggers are when the agent is submitted. Those are the first triggers that fire off. Those could be fields, they could be templates, they could be um, field sections, it just kind of depends. Thankfully, the way that we built this one out is that you can kind of see what these are from this view. I'll go ahead and zoom in a little bit because I know it's super small. Um, here you can see like this one's add alarm codes. This one says it removes seller concessions, adds critical dates, adds finance details, inspection, appraisal. Now with this account, when, when you sign up for a new account, um, you're going to automatically have these triggers built out and those triggers are going to have their conditional logic already added to them. So when I go down, you know, add critical property dates, EM commission fields, these need to come on every single time onto my transaction. So I'm cool with this. However, 
if the financing type is not equal to cash, that's when I need financing type. But if it is equal to cash, I don't really need my financing details, right? If I scroll down for the inspection um, and repair field section, we don't need that information unless we are handling an inspection. So a lot of the conditional logics already built out with it to make sure that it brings on the correct things that it needs to bring on. So if you need to review those, like I said, you can click on sort templates or sort triggers, I'm sorry, sort triggers. And here you can see we've got field sections at the top and templates at the bottom. Anything that is in this peach color is going to be after it's approved, what do we need to apply? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and click on close. I'm gonna click on trigger options to make sure my triggers are expanded. And I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom. At the very bottom, you'll most likely see that date template. But as you scroll up, you'll see the referral information. Is there a loan? Then we get our finance tasks. Will there be an appraisal? Then we get our appraisal tasks, our appraisal documents. And so this kind of shows you how it's built out right now to bring on that information to that particular property. To edit it, we can just click on where it says template if we'd like to. We can either delete the the, the assets. This is what these are, trigger temp, uh, task template or, or document template. Or we can just turn it off. Let's say you don't do the, that particular part. I know that we had added in some stuff that maybe you guys don't do. You don't do home protection. Totally fine. Turn it off. The reason I suggest turning it off versus deleting it is because, well, what if you decide to offer that in the future, right? It's easier to just flip that switch and have it already there versus having to, you know, rebuild it from the ground up kind of thing. So just keep that in mind. Same thing with any other part of the system. If you're like, well, you know, I don't really deal with HOAs very much, you know, or I don't deal with HOAs at all. I've really never dealt with them before. You can turn that off. But you can also, you know, later on, if something changes in your process, you can turn it back on. Cool. The other thing that I want to touch on, if you're brand new to the system and you're like, you know, Hannah, when I went to fill out that intake form, it was kind of weird. Like I had to like scroll up and like scroll back down. And like, you know, I had to change a lot of things on that. Int you know, I had to like, I was like all over the place, right? When you first get your account, there are some maintenance things that need to be done to that account before you can get started with it. The one main maintenance thing is getting the layout of this intake form in the correct order. Um, what it likes to do when you get a new account is the layout. So back on my intake forms, we'll head down to where it says underneath settings layout. What it likes to do is it likes to convert it back to how your fields are organized. So the way that your fields are organized and the way that your intake forms are organized, they're two separate things. The way that your layout is should be pretty much close to this. So I'll leave it on this screen. What I want you to mainly take notice of is that we've got our address up at the very top. Then we get to our property questions, our contract questions, then our critical details, property details, and then so on and so forth with all the other fields. Now, some of these fields might show up every single time. Some of them may not. It just depends, right? Because we might have different form conditions to say, well, if I say that the contract, uh, you know, if I say that the, the property is within an HOA, then maybe it brings on me additional details. So when I go to preview that intake form, this is how it should look. You should get your address at the top. Once you've updated that layout, shows us our address. And then we get into the questions. That way, when I say, yes, there's an HOA, yes, this house was built after this time, yes, there's an alarm, I don't have to scroll back up to fill out the information. I just keep going down the page. And as I go down the page, I'm going to see, here's that alarm code. Looks like I don't have anything for HOA right now, but I could have something built out for the other parts of the system. If I say, yes, there's a referral, yes, there's an inspection, yes, there's a loan, right? Still answering these questions, I can say, you know, today's the date. We'll say no, no, no. If I answer these questions, as I scroll down, more fields are going to show up. Here's that financing details, lead-based paint showed up, showed up on here, referral details showed up on here, what type of inspections we're handling on showed up on here. So you can see that once you have that layout in the correct order, then you don't have to worry about scrolling back up, filling out the information, scrolling back down, and then saying save and continue to submit that intake form. Let me know if there's any other questions. We are at, we are just about at time. Um, we covered a lot of topics today. Thank you guys so much for all the questions. I love when we have like an active class like this and we can go through a ton of things. Um, but if there's any other questions or anything else that you guys wanted to review, definitely feel free to ask them now. Um, I'll just talk about some of the 
the other support that we have within Open and Close. Obviously, you can chat with us anytime you need to by accessing the chat down here at the bottom. Um, you can also email us at help at Open and Close if you're like, well, chatting's not really necessary right now, but I do want to send in an email with something that I've seen. Um, if you guys need our support center, you're like, where do I get to the, the, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the support center for this, you're going to click on your little person icon. You're going to click on support center. And then this is going to pull open all of our articles. Awesome, Todd. I'm glad that, um, you've been meeting some of our team members. Um, so here advice and answers from open to close. If you're like, well, Hannah talked about smart blocks. I want to learn a little bit more type in smart blocks, press enter and you'll find it. One thing that I would suggest when you're searching our support center is just make sure that you're sticking to the similar naming conventions that we have within open to close. So if you notice, I didn't put smart blocks one word. I have it as two separate words. So here in open to close says smart blocks. Just make sure you're doing smart blocks here when we're searching for it as well. Just because we don't refer to them as smart blocks one word. <laughs> um, and I don't want you guys to be like, there's no articles, Hannah. Where are all the articles with it? Well, there is no articles with smart blocks one word. So just keep that in mind. If you're ever looking for something, try out a couple different names with it. Just type in smart and see what you get. Just type in blocks, see what you get. Just type in tasks and see what you get, right? Because it kind of just depends on what you need. There's a lot of examples in here of how we can handle things. I mean, triggers is one of the big ones, right? There's tons of things with the word trigger that's involved with open to close. I think that here we're going to see a lot of trigger pipeline, trigger snapshots, trigger statuses, right? There's going to be a bunch of different things there. If you're looking for more webinars like today, you can head to our open to close website. You can go to the learn tab and go to webinars. Today, we just finished up Wednesday workshop. Next week, we're going over using open to close on Tuesday. This is going to be a great call for anyone who wants to see more of that front end use. Um, and, and how do I go through and set up my tables and segments? How do I alter my snapshots? How do I, you know, set up things for my email or how do I set up myself as a new user? How do I get myself onto a team? We're going to be covering a lot of that, how to use open to close on that call. And then next Wednesday, we're going to be going over intake forms and property templates. So let me make sure I get your name right. Whitney, that would be a really, really great call for you to be on the one where we talk about intake forms and property templates. We're going to do a deep dive talking about our fields, talking about our form conditions, talking about our form triggers. We're going to be talking about, do we want to ask for contacts? Do we want to ask for documents? What's the best practice for getting our, our agents involved with us? Um, how do I get my agents involved with us? How do I send over those intake forms for them to fill out? Do I want to make it more agent heavy or, or internal heavy? You know, there's a, so there's a lot of really great information we go on, on that call. We also review property templates as well. Um, and kind of learn, you know, what if, uh, what if I'm not ready for intake forms? You know, they, I want to just jump into the system right away. I want to start using it on the front end. I want to get kind of used to how things populate. We can do that. Yeah, absolutely. So what you're going to do is you're just, you can just go to open to close. You'll go to that learn tab and you can click on webinars. And then for Tuesday, you'll just click on register. I think it should pull up in the register page for me. Perfect. And then let me type an answer. That's for Tuesday. And then for the following Wednesday, here's Wednesday. I'm going to click on register again. Let me grab that one. Poof. There we go. So I, I, I put it as a reply to your message. Um, I can also grab those and drop them in the chat as well. If anyone else is interested in joining. Let me see if I can do that here, everyone. Boom. For next week. Yeah. Yeah. So in my account, I have some sneak preview stuff in my account. And that's what that secure form versus public form is. Um, I'm not sure what we've released or announced yet, but there's just some fun things coming down the line for our intake forms um, that are pretty exciting. We're still in the process of building it out and testing it. I have it because I'm part of that testing crew. Um, but it's, it's some very, very fun stuff that's coming down. I want you guys to think of when you're reviewing your intake forms, especially when you're editing them that here, that secure form is similar to that preview form. So it's really just previewing that intake form. It doesn't do anything else. That's a, that's different. It's just previewing that intake form. So you could still kind of like fill it out, um, and do what you need to do with it. So it's, it's still the same button. It's just that public form is something else. That's really fun. That's not been announced yet. I don't think it's been announced yet, so I'm not going to say anything about it, but it's exciting. Next year is going to be really great. We've got a lot of things coming down the pipeline. 
Um, cool. So we've talked about webinars. We've talked about resources. I think the only other thing that I like to touch on before I let you guys go is review that change log. Um, we've had a lot of recent updates to our system, just making things better, you know, um, updating different things, updating special characters and categories, um, you know, just making some different updates to the different, um, areas of our system. And the change log is a really great place. If you're like, huh, I wonder, this seems different. Did they make a change? Go ahead and check out that change log to see, you know, what kind of changes we've made. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to go up to that person icon up at the top, and then you're going to be able to see that change log right underneath affiliate program. Of course, Whitney, thank you guys for joining. Alrighty, we are at time. Um, like I said, I don't mind if you guys have any other last minute questions for me, definitely feel free to drop them in. Otherwise, um, I hope I will see you next week. Yeah, thanks for joining again, Todd. I appreciate all of your guys' questions. You really have no idea how much I, I enjoy going through this with you guys. Yeah, thanks again, Kyle. Yeah, you guys have a wonderful day too. I hope that your week is nice and warm. It's been, the weather's been really strange. <laughs> It's been cold, but then again, it's been warm. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you, and I will see you next week.